So with that, Derek, today we're talking about boats. Boats also uh, are typically uh, going to encompass the PWC world. Pretty much if it goes on the water, we're going to consider it a, a boat and a jet ski, uh, a sea do, a stand up, uh, the pontoon boat, the ski boat, uh, the runabout boat. All of that is going to be encompassed today. And for simplicity, we're going to refer to all of those as boats. Uh, commonly, watercraft is going to uh, kind of cover that whole spectrum, but most of what we'll refer to as boats, but that will apply to just about anything that goes on the water. As a reminder, our workshop that is scheduled for next month is an update on no-fault reform. Like you know, we spent uh, just about all of 2020 educating and preparing and working toward the new auto insurance law that applies now in Michigan. Of course, we've scheduled that update for June which coincidentally is roughly a year after the new auto insurance law became effective. Uh, so if you care to join us for that, please register or jump on for that workshop that is being hosted next month for an update on no-fault reform. Now for today, Derek, two pieces of the puzzle. Number one, is my boat insured? How do I know? Where do I see it? And how does that work? Number two, should my family have uninsured boater coverage. Kind of a unique coverage, not uh, super common in most insurance plans, but can be very, very valuable in the right situation. So to get started with part one, is my boat or PWC insured? Well, how do I know, Derek, and, and what questions do I need to keep in mind to understand if it is insured and does that coverage apply automatically? Or did I have to do something for that coverage? Tell me, what do I need to know? Yeah, it's, it's going to be very specific to the boat itself, as well as the insurance company that's providing the coverage. So in general, what's going to uh, determine whether that boat is automatically covered by the homeowner's policy or needs its own boat insurance policy, or maybe it can go on the homeowner's policy itself, but it needs to be listed on there in order to be covered. And some of those main characteristics are What's the motor like? Is it an inboard, such as a Mastercraft? Is it an inboard outboard, which is kind of your standard, um, you know, Michigan boat, your, your Sea Ray or, or your boat like that? Is it an outboard? Um, those types of things really make a big impact on whether that policy is going to provide coverage for it uh, and whether it's going to be on the appropriate policy for it or not. Noted here, PWC, uh, that's your jet ski uh, or your sea do type of, of boat. And they've also got some uh, you know, requirements for how much horsepower that's gonna have and how long it is and those sorts of things. Lastly, a sailboat, that falls in a little bit of another category as well when it comes to the coverage. So really it's gonna be, what type of motor does it have? Uh, you know, is, it a, is it a jet ski and does it have a sail on it and therefore is, is wind powered? Uh, huh. How big is it as well? That's a big consideration also. Uh, is it a jet ski that's 11 feet long or is it a 50 foot cigarette boat? Um, that's gonna be uh, taken into consideration as well when determining how should that boat be insured. Again, whether it needs its own policy, whether it's automatically covered by an existing policy or whether it's gonna be covered by a homeowner's policy but needs to be specifically listed on there. Got it. So it's possible that the boat that I own may be covered automatically by my home insurance policy without me ever doing anything or paying any additional premium for it. But that probably depends on what type of coverage I'm expecting my policy to provide, um, right? I, I mean, I understand that liability coverage uh, can apply in certain situations automatically, typically for something that is outboard motor, slow, small, that type of thing, right? Right, right. Yep, absolutely. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a, a, a challenging situation because every insurance policy is going to be a little bit different. The actual homeowner's policy itself, but you're right. Depending on the horsepower of the motor and what type of motor it is, again, outboard versus inboard, uh, and the length of it, uh, it might be automatically covered by that homeowner's policy for liability coverage. Okay. What I about when my boat sinks or I hit a rock or it's stolen with the trailer? Is that ever going to be covered by my home insurance? Maybe it's even parked in my garage when it's stolen. What happens then? No, 
Contrary to popular belief, that type of thing is not going to be covered by a homeowner's policy, even if the boat is in the garage when that occurred or a tree from the backyard happened to fall on it during a windstorm. Uh, damage to the boat itself is never automatically provided. That boat needs to have its own coverage and therefore it needs to be disclosed, whether it's on its own policy or on the homeowner's policy. So yeah. liability coverage, might be automatic if it's a small boat, uh, short and has low ho horsepower. But if you want coverage for damage to the boat itself, uh, you're going to have to specifically list that somewhere. Got it. Okay. So in general, I may have liability coverage provided automatically in relatively few situations, but I certainly don't have physical damage coverage provided by my boat automatically. So to be safe, let's say the general rule is that if my boat is not listed somewhere on my home insurance or I don't have a separate boat insurance policy, it's probably not covered, at least not the way I intend. Correct? Correct. Okay. So here's the exception for the liability coverage that you mentioned earlier. Most home insurance policies are going to have some level of liability coverage built in there. That's lawsuit protection. When you think about home insurance, you think about the dog biting the neighborhood kid or the mailman slipping in the icy driveway, the friend that falls down the steps. That's what people think of when they're talking about their home insurance liability coverage. But most home insurance policies also have a little bit of a subsection that says this also applies to certain watercraft that you may own. Usually it's going to be very restricted. So it's got to be small. It's got to be slow. It's got to have an outboard motor. Correct. That's right. And I, I think what's important to note is that coverage is built into your standard homeowner's policy in most cases, again, for your small, slow boat. Kind of like how you mentioned the dog bite. Well, hey, even if I don't own a dog, my homeowner's policy is going to provide liability coverage for that dog bite. So even if, you know, your insurance agent or the insurance company has no idea that you do or don't have a boat, the basic homeowner's policy is going to pro probably provide some liability coverage uh, for that small and slow boat. Got it. Okay, great. So if my boat's not going to qualify, which very few boats are going to qualify for, for that automatic coverage, where should it be insured? Should it be right on my home insurance policy? Do I need a separate boat insurance policy? What do you typically see in terms of how that best gets set up? Yeah, well, that's going to uh, depend on the specific insurance company. Some insurance companies are okay with putting almost any type of boat directly on the homeowner's policy. Could be a small fishing boat, maybe a 22-foot Mastercraft, maybe it's a 45-foot cabin cruiser that goes out in Lake Michigan. Uh, other insurance companies say, unless it's that small little fishing boat, we don't want it on the homeowner's policy. And in that instance, that boat needs to have its own policy, uh, which we would call a boat policy. So gotcha. it really is going to depend on the specifics of the boat itself and then the insurance company that's actually going to be providing the coverage. Okay. I would say in our instance, most of the time we will put the boat directly on the homeowner's policy if we're able to. Um, usually you have a little bit of rating advan uh, advantage by doing that, but uh, in certain instances, it's more appropriate to actually put the boat on its own policy, uh, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. And either way, I'm going to be able to secure very similar coverage, whether I'm doing it right on my home insurance because it's eligible, or maybe it's not, and I have to do it separately. I'm going to be able to find similar coverage between both of those avenues, right? Yeah, you're going to find the liability coverage, the physical damage coverage, uh, probably coverage for your trailer if you choose it, those types okay. of things, regardless of which policy it's going to actually be covered by. Okay, that's perfect. Well, let's take a quick look at what you mentioned, liability coverage. And it's important to understand there are really two pieces of the puzzle here in boat insurance. It's the liability coverage, and then it's the physical damage coverage. The liability coverage is I am being sued because something went wrong with my boat. My boat not, might not have any damage. It might still be floating there in the lake or sitting on my boat lift, but I have a lawsuit on my hands because something went wrong on the water. So you're going to see something like this here in your home insurance policy or on your separate boat insurance policy that's going to state the liability coverage. In our example here, uh, there are two boats, two inboard boats shown, and then a 2015 Sea-Doo GTS. You'll see that says water jet propelled. Uh, that's fancy word for 
it's a CDU. Uh, so here we're going to see the liability coverage applying to all three of these watercraft. This is directly on a home insurance policy. You'll see it shows the, a description, the length of the horsepower, the top miles per hour or top speed for each of those items. And this is taking the liability coverage in the home insurance policy and extending it to each of these watercraft. You could do something very similar on a separate boat insurance policy, listing all three watercraft and selecting the liability coverage that you want to have. It's important to understand this is providing lawsuit protection for your ownership and use of these boats. And Brian, I noticed here that the horsepower is actually noted for each of the boats. And I think it's really important to remember that the homeowner's policy it has, in general, uh, a limitation for whether liability coverage is going to be provided based on specifics of the motor. So horsepower is extremely important to know when you buy or are owning a boat and you're trying to insure it. Because if the homeowner's policy automatically provides liability coverage for a boat with, let's say, 100 horsepower or less, and you think it's got 100, but it happens to have 110, well that boat needed to be specifically listed on the homeowner's policy or have its own policy uh, instead of just be automatically relied upon. Sure. Someone could really be uh, you know, surprised by that if God forbid something happened and the boat did not qualify for the automatic coverage that that person was relying on. Sure, absolutely. Second piece of the puzzle, the physical damage coverage. And this is the obvious one. This is what people think of. My boat sank, my boat caught on fire. It was stolen on the trailer or off the boat lift. Uh, I hit a rock and damaged the prop. This is the physical damage coverage that's going to pay for the damage that actually happened to the boat. It often looks very similar to an auto insurance policy. You're going to see something like comprehensive coverage and collision coverage. Sometimes it will just simply say physical damage coverage. There's going to be a deductible that applies much like your auto insurance policy. But unlike an auto insurance policy, you will see a coverage limit listed for your boat. In this example here, we see a $10,000 value. What that sets is the maximum that the insurance company would pay if that boat were a total loss. So at the time of a total loss, much like they'll do with your vehicle, the insurance company will hire an appraisal company to prepare an estimate of what that vehicle was actually worth, and they'll pay you out for that total loss. Same thing goes for the boat, except that we're setting the upper limit of what they will pay. So if this boat were totaled and the valuation says it's worth $12,000, the most the insurance company will pay is 10,000 because that's the coverage limit we've put on the policy. If it's worth 8,000 or 9,000, they'll pay 8,000 or 9,000 because that's what the market value was. So that coverage limit is setting the upper, the maximum amount that the insurance company will pay if there's a total loss on that boat. So Brian, if I paid 10 grand for a boat, but I want to insure it for $100,000, can I list it for $100,000 on my policy? You, if you can get it through the underwriting process, you sure can, but you're going to be paying for insurance on a $100,000 boat that is never going to pay out anywhere near that, right? You're paying for coverage that's never going to, to pay out unless you bought it for 10,000 and you got the steal of the century. Say it actually is worth 100 grand, um, then sure, insure it for a hundred grand because that's what it's worth. Uh, but oftentimes you want to be relatively appropriate with the realistic market value of that boat. Otherwise you're just paying for a ton of coverage that would never really pay out uh, because it's going to be limited to the market value at the time of that loss. Sounds like there are a lot of specifics about a boat that you have to know that aren't necessarily uh, applicable when you're buying a vehicle. You have that's to right. know the length, the horsepower, whether the motor is inboard or outboard. You have to know um, the value of it. Uh, we don't ask that when someone buys a vehicle. We say, what's the VIN? And away we go. Yeah. Not the case with a boat. So very important to have all of these uh, things available when you are adding insurance to a boat. Right. And, and the beauty of a VIN number today to an automobile is that it can all be looked up in the, in the database. So that, that information is all readily available. When it comes to boats, it's not. We're literally taking that information from the purchase invoice or from the client that bought the boat and then plugging it all in because there's no system that's going to look up the hall ID number for the boat and then populate that data. That physical damage coverage that we're talking about, Derek, when does it apply? You mentioned earlier that when my boat is in my garage, it's not covered by my home insurance policy. 
So I need to have my own separate coverage for the boat. What if I'm towing it to the lake or it's sitting on the boat lift? Um, when is my boat covered by this physical damage coverage that I've added either to my home insurance policy or on a separate boat insurance policy? Yeah, well, it's really going to apply almost everywhere. Uh, and that's important because there's really not any other policy that's going to provide coverage for it. Like we mentioned, your homeowner's policy is not going to provide coverage for it, even if it's in the garage or in the backyard when uh, it gets stolen or destroyed by a fire. Uh, it's also not going to be covered by your auto insurance policy when you are towing it or backing it down the boat launch. Uh, so it's important to, to know that it's really not going to be covered by anything other than the specific boat insurance coverage that you choose. But the good news is that if you chose that coverage, it's going to apply to that boat in almost every single scenario. So when it's being towed, when it's in the yard, when it's hooked up to the dock, uh, when it's in storage at the marina, uh, it's going to be covered in all of those instances. Got it. That's great. Thanks. Contrary to that, what about my stuff that I take on my boat? Uh, say it's my wakeboards and water skis or the tubes, uh, my fishing gear. What about the stuff that I take with me when I go out on my boat? Is, is that covered somewhere else? Is it covered by my boat insurance? How does that work? It's going to generally uh, depend on how the boat is actually covered. Sometimes there will be a little bit of coverage for the stuff that you keep on the boat, but the general rule is that uh, you need to rely on your homeowner's policy to provide coverage for your wakeboards, your water skis, your tubes, your life jackets, those types of things, your personal property. Uh, so I would say in general, the boat insurance is not going to provide coverage for the things that you use with the boat unless they are permanently attached to it, such as um, you know, a, a ski rack or something like that. Sure, okay, great, that's helpful. Now, I've been out to the lake enough times to know that it's not always the boat owner that's the one out driving the boat on the lake. How does that work? Can I let someone else drive my boat? What type of situation am I going to run into there? Yeah, you can let someone else drive your boat, but it's important to know that as the owner of the boat and the person that gave somebody else permission to use it, you're going to be dragged into a lawsuit if, God forbid, something happens when they're, uh, you know, behind the wheel of it. So, yes, you can let someone else drive your boat, but make sure that it's someone that you trust to actually be using it. It's someone that's experienced and it's someone that's probably uh, most importantly sober when they uh, hop behind there and start using it. Because if you say, hey, you know, Uncle John, go ahead and, uh, and take this thing out and feel the horsepower uh, and they're an inexperienced boater and they happen to lose control and, and cause an accident, well, they're going to be sued as the person that was driving it, and you're going to be sued as the owner of the boat and the person that gave them permission to use it when you probably shouldn't have handed the keys over to them. Okay. So here we say that you might share your liability coverage, and that's because my own boat insurance coverage, my liability coverage is going to apply to me, but also the fellow that I let drive my boat. So he's eating into my coverage amount that I designated for myself. But unfortunately, my coverage applies to him too. So now we're both sharing within that same set coverage amount when it comes to that lawsuit, right? Yes, because that coverage applies on a per accident basis. So if I feel comfortable having a million dollars of coverage when I'm behind the wheel of my boat, uh, but I lend it to a buddy and he happens to kill someone, well, that million dollars applies per accident, not per person. So me and my buddy are going to be sharing that million dollars of liability coverage. And I'm not covered in the same amount uh, that I thought I was. Got it. Okay. Which of course brings up the ever important umbrella policy, which we've had a separate workshop specific to umbrella policies. Uh, we suggest you refer back to that if you have concerns about your umbrella policy, uh, but certainly it is a must for anyone that owns a boat strictly for the reason that you mentioned above, but also many others of why that umbrella is such a critical part of an insurance plan today. Now, a couple of claim examples from, from our office here that have actually taken place when it comes to boat insurance. We're not gonna go into these in any level of detail because we wanna move into the second piece of this uh, workshop, uh, which we're going to do very uh, quickly in the interest of time, but uh, boat sinking. When a pontoon boat uh, is 
punctured, paint damage when it's dinged up against a dock, uh, hitting something submerged. Uh, God forbid there's an injury to someone that you're pulling behind the boat with a tube or a water ski, uh, or even worse, you're turning around to pick somebody up and you don't see somebody swimming in the water. Uh, of course, we all hope that those never happen to us or anyone we know or anyone for that matter. Uh, but that's why insurance exists. None of us think that's going to happen. None of us plan for that to happen. Uh, but things can go wrong on the water, especially if you're on a busy lake or if you're boating with inexperienced people. So expert tip number one, the very start of this, we said don't assume that your boat is automatically covered. It's probably not. So ask your agent for help. How do we best ensure this for what type of coverage we intend to have? Is it an old boat that we just need liability coverage for? Fine. Uh, is it expensive? Should I have physical damage coverage too? Great. Uh, it's certainly coverage that can be secured, but don't assume that it's automatic. Number two, be conscious of your liability coverage. Uh, we're all out on the water trying to relax and have fun and spend time with friends and family, uh, but things can and do go wrong. The worst of those is going to be a lawsuit that is a result of something happening on the water. So your liability coverage is absolutely critical. Part two here, Derek, and we're going to do this in two minutes. Uninsured boater coverage. Uninsured boater coverage is a somewhat rare coverage that you'll see, but it is available in many situations, uh, and it is going to provide compensation to you or your family if you are the ones who are awarded a lawsuit against someone else and that other person doesn't have boat insurance. Now, boat insurance is not required by law, which means many people don't have it. Auto insurance is required by law, and still almost a third of people in Michigan don't have it. So if that many people are willing to drive without car insurance, how many people are boating without boat insurance? It's probably a relatively high figure. So example of when this uninsured boater coverage would come into place, say me and my family, we're swimming off the back of our boat out on Torch Lake, beautiful little cove that we found, it's nice and calm, and a young person driving a sea -Doo that they borrowed from a neighbor is out on the water. They lose control, squeeze the trigger as they're falling off, and that sea -Doo is now projected toward my family in the water. Let's say that we are injured because that thing comes ripping right past us. If we are awarded a lawsuit because we have injuries, that person driving that sea -Doo probably doesn't have boat insurance, which means I'm holding a very large lawsuit that is good for nothing. My own uninsured boater coverage would pay that lawsuit to me so that I'm not losing out because someone else on the water was boating without insurance and they caused an injury to me or my family. So it's protecting me and my family from other people on the water around us that may cause a boating accident and generate a lawsuit that we are awarded. Derek, who usually chooses uninsured boater coverage? Well, like you said, it's boater with a family. They've got people out there that they're tubing, they're water skiing, they're swimming off the boat. You know, obviously that's going to lead to a higher chance of something unfortunate happening. Uh, people also that are on small and busy lakes. If you are, you know, pretty uh, repeatedly on any of the lakes in Rockford, you'll know that they get a little bit crazy each summer and you probably end the weekend thinking, oh gosh, we, we survived another one without anything uh, bad happening. But guess what? Inevitably, something seems to happen. Um, and the smaller the lake and the more populated it is, the more boats that are out there. And that's of course going to lead to some confusion around which, you know, uh, way you go around the lake and, um, you know, what the, what the proper protocols are when you come across other boaters. So, sure. uh, the last one here, boaters that have been to the sandbar on Torch Lake. I think anybody that's seen people drinking and boating, uh, knows that, um, probably not the best decision. And that person, uh, might not be all that attentive behind the wheel of their boat. And if God forbid they cause that accident with you, the uninsured boater coverage is going to make sure that, uh, that lawsuit you win gets paid. Got it. Great. So expert tip when it comes to uninsured boater coverage, if it's appropriate for your family and if it's a concern that you have, ask your insurance agent to add it in 
to your coverage. It's likely available and it's probably not very expensive, usually 50, 60, 70 bucks a year for uninsured voter coverage. And that's typically for half a million dollars of coverage. So very inexpensive for the amount of bang that's provided. Um, if that gives you some peace of mind and lets you enjoy that time on the water just a little bit more. So with that, uh, we are two minutes over schedule, so we apologize for uh, dragging our feet just a couple minutes there, but thank you for joining us. We certainly appreciate uh, your attendance, and we appreciate you walking through all this information with us. We are here to help. Uh, we, of course, love working with families that have boats. Our whole team loves to go boating. Uh, we're usually tagging along with friends and family because most of us don't have our own, um, but we, we love to talk about boats. We love working with families that have boats and we are here to help. So uh, again, thank you for your trust. Thank you for your business. Thanks for working with us and our team. Uh, we are here to help. And with that, uh, we will put a plug in for the No Fault Reform update workshop that is gonna be taking place next month. Um, but at this time, Derek and I are going to stay on and hang out. We have a couple others from our team that are gonna stay on here. Uh, so if you have questions, concerns, things you'd like more specific information on, we'll be on this call and we're happy to chat in any level of detail. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat feature in Zoom and we'll be happy to answer any questions at this point.